Hi, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich and I'm a consultant in clinical neurophysiology. Welcome to my YouTube channel and this explanatory video regarding tarsal tunnel syndrome. In this video, I'm going to explain how the clinical diagnosis is made, how supportive tests such as neurophysiology are used to make the diagnosis and current management options. So thank you for joining us and let's proceed. There are, of course, two types of tarsal tunnel syndrome. The relatively more common form is the posterior tarsal tunnel syndrome, which affects the tibial nerve as it passes through the inner aspect of the ankle. And then there is the anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome, which affects the peroneal nerve as it passes down the roof of the foot. Let's have a look at the anatomy. We have a flexor tenaculum, which joins the tibial bone to the calcaneus bone, and underneath it runs the tibial nerve, which divides into its three main branches. The medial plantar sensory nerve gives rise to sensation from the medial aspect of the foot. The lateral plantar sensory nerve gives rise to sensation from the side of the foot, and the calcaneal branches give rise to sensation from the heel of the foot. Symptoms of tarsal tunnel syndrome include pain over the inner aspect of the foot, numbness in the relevant nerve territories, pins and needles, burning discomfort, hot and cold sensations in the feet, nocturnal awakening with foot tingling, worsening of symptoms as the day goes on, foot cramping and also swelling as well. There are a number of well-established risk factors for developing tarsal tunnel syndrome. These include a variety of anatomical anomalies, whether of the nerves or the muscles or of the joints themselves, those who have had trauma to the ankle itself, those who lead a very active lifestyle, for example, um, athletes or ballerinas or people who are walking around all day long, those who have got flat feet, and a variety of medical conditions, including diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis can predispose to this. Unsurprisingly, for a weight-bearing joint, we have quite a wide differential diagnosis. The most important things to consider are, of course, arthritis, plantar fasciitis, tendonitis, tenosynovitis, bursitis, um, subclinical fractures, and vascular disease, and neuropathy, including small fiber peripheral neuropathy. Of course, tarsal tunnel is primarily a clinical diagnosis and relies on the classical constellation of clinical symptoms, as I've just described, and clinical signs, such as atrophy of the muscles, weakness of the muscles, tunnel sign, um, so for the posterior tarsal tunnel, this will be shooting discomfort into the underneath of the foot, or for the anterior tarsal tunnel, shooting on the top of the foot. There's an phalen equivalent stress test where we evert the ankle and also flex it, and pull up the toes as well to maximize the potential stress on the tibial nerve and maintain that position for up to about 10 seconds and that should reproduce the symptoms in apparently 85% of patients. And then of course there are supportive tests such as nerve conduction studies and EMG and also imaging as well. It's important when we consider the benefits of imaging to consider that it can also help us understand what's going on inside the nerve tunnel itself and also for alternative differential diagnoses it might be able to suggest those as causes. Over here is a wonderful uh, review by uh, Wong and Tan in the European Journal of Radiology which would provide a very good overview of the differential diagnoses that imaging can help establish. There is a frequently made analogy to carpal tunnel syndrome. Superficially, both of these conditions involve a nerve being entrapped as they pass through a bony tunnel roofed by a flexor tenaculum with vasculature and flexor tendons passing through the same space. However, that's really where the comparison ends. Carpal tunnel syndrome is of course very common, whereas tarsal tunnel syndrome is really not quite as common as some people think it is. Importantly, when we think about the pathophysiology and the mechanisms involved in carpal tunnel syndrome, people who use their hands repetitively are at most risk of developing this condition where the flexor tendons swell up and they start pushing on the median nerve. That situation is not the same when we walk in tarsal tunnel syndrome. We don't walk around flexing our toes all the time. And so really the comparison ends very quickly outside of the basic anatomy of the situation. So let's talk about the diagnostic problem here. Pain in the ankle is quite common. It's a highly weight-bearing joint. 
Tinel sign is notoriously nonspecific, even in carpal tunnel syndrome. And when we think about moving beyond the clinical diagnosis and into things such as nerve conduction tests, they are often quite difficult to perform in the feet, particularly of older patients. And let me explain why. There are technical issues here, for example, the skin condition. So uh, older patients tend to have thicker skin and that's very difficult for both stimulating and recording nerve signals through. Quite often there may be edema, which also impedes signal transmission as well. Temperature in the feet is often fairly cool and this slows down nerve conductions in the feet and can therefore provide false positive findings of prolongation of distal latencies. We have the normal aging process as well, which can impede on what sensory responses we would expect to obtain and also amplitudes of the motor responses, because let us not forget we are spending a lifetime of walking around on our feet and that causes various issues to the nerves there as well. Normative data is too permissive in my opinion, and it can be very difficult to make this diagnosis as well when symptoms are bilateral. EMG itself is painful in the feet and findings can be considered uncertain too as chronic denervation is often encountered. Another difficulty can also be the presence of coexistent neuropathy and it becomes impossible to make the diagnosis accurately in that situation. Let me show you a couple of slides of a patient who I have seen with tarsal tunnel. I'm going to start showing you the normal side and we'll start with the sensory studies. The top signal there is from the medial plantar nerve and it has an amplitude of eight and a half microvolts, it's millionths of a volt, so these are very small responses and it's got a conduction velocity of 49 meters per second. We have the lateral plantar sensory response to there, which is two and a half microvolts. That's just two and a half millionths of a volt. And its conduction velocity is 45 meters per second. Now these are normal values. If we have a look at the other side, we can see that we have a recordable medial plantar sensory response. However, the amplitude is reduced compared to the other side. So this is just 3.4 microvolts and its conduction velocity has slowed by about 10 meters per second. And so it's only 38 meters per second here. We do not have a recordable response from the lateral plantar sensory nerve in this case. And just to make it very clear, we can overlap these signals here. And you can see in the highlighted green uh, traces that that is the affected left side and we have the small and delayed medial sensory response from the medial plantar nerve and we have no response from the lateral plantar sensory nerve. Let's have a look at the motor study. So this is from the right unaffected foot. So we have got responses here from the tibial nerve as it innervates the abductor digiti quinti muscle as the top line and that has a latency of three and a half milliseconds. The bottom line you can see is the tibial abductor hallucis motor response, and that is normal. We're now going to have a look at the other side, and you can see here, top line again, as the tibial nerve innervates the abductor digiti quinti muscle, its latency is 4.91 milliseconds and the abductor hallucis is again normal. Now, in terms of an absolute value, the distal latency of the ADQ muscle is actually normal. But let's just put the two of these together and you can see here the green line is the normal side and the gray line is the abnormal side. We can see very clearly that there is prolongation of the distal latency. The whole curve is shift on the top tracing of the ADQ muscle and it is demyelinating there in terms of its distal latency. The abductor hallucis response is normal and is symmetrical between the two sides. So putting all of these findings together, we have an absent lateral plantar sensory nerve potential. We have a mildly delayed and reduced amplitude on the medial plantar sensory nerve action potential. We have a normal tibial abductor hallucis compound muscle action potential, but we have a delayed tibial abductor digiti quinti compound motor action potential and that comes to the lateral plantar nerve um, on that side and so we have a tarsal tunnel lesion primarily affecting the lateral plantar nerve and to a milder extent this is only really the sensory aspect of it the medial plantar fibers too and so when we consider the clinical 
diagnosis and we consider the neurophysiological diagnosis, we have a little bit of a conundrum because on the one hand, if we rely on clinical pain and a Tinel sign, we will be over-diagnosing patients potentially with this condition. However, if we rely on the nerve conduction studies and these can be only relatively abnormal too and technically challenging to perform, then we can actually be under-reporting these. And so we have to make a correct balance between the clinical diagnosis and the neurophysiological diagnosis and be able to recognize that perhaps clinically it's being overdiagnosed and neurophysiologically it is being underdiagnosed. Let's talk a little bit about management now. So in terms of proper evidence-based medicine, there is a real deficit of high quality evidence-based studies in terms of efficacy of conservative treatments and of surgical treatments too. Conservative treatments include strapping the ankle into a neutral or into an inverted position, orthoses to support the longitudinal arches within the footwear, immobilizing braces particularly at night, modification of activity and physiotherapy. Pain relief is also very important particularly in the acute stages, ice may be beneficial, a variety of different types of massages, and a whole host of medications, which could potentially include non-steroidals, gabapentins, uh, amitriptyline, to name but a few. There is, of course, surgical options available, and it's really important to consider just how successful these may or may not be. The literature has been very varied over the years in terms of success rates. Sometimes it's only reported as perhaps 15% successful, and sometimes it can be reported up to 90% successful. And so it's important when one considers the actual evidence for the different types of surgeries involved, that one has an understanding that there are different techniques available, and these are constantly being improved upon. There are, of course, different types of causes which can lead to different outcomes. So, for example, if there is some kind of a lesion there inside the tarsal tunnel, um, that has a better outcome surgically than those which are non-lesional causes. Timing from symptom onset is also quite important too, and there is some evidence that patients who operated on within 10 months of symptom onset have a better outcome than those who have delayed treatment. And there are, of course, different types of post-operative rehabilitation plans, uh, which may also come into play as well. And there is some evidence that early mobilization may be actually beneficial for patients. And of course, the final thing to think about is the patient population selection too. So, for example, should patients with diabetes have an operation on their tarsal tunnel? Will that be beneficial for them? And really, the jury's out on that, and there is calls for better information, randomized control trials to answer that particular question. I hope you found this video useful and if you have found it useful, please do support the channel by liking, sharing and subscribing. Thank you very much and I hope to see you in the next video shortly.